Zekius.
Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, we've been listening to the Kurdish Women Choir Lazer. Uh, we've been working with them um, uh, with our production of the Icicles play, uh, The Suppliants, and we love working with them. Um, we're going to listen to them two more times tonight. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> The text in Kermanji is subtitled. You probably saw that uh, behind me. Um, yes, my name is Yuri Albrecht. I'm director of the Bali, and I'm tonight incredibly honored to speak with Mazi Alina Jad, uh, who traveled here even though uh, it's very dangerous for her, and it's been uh, uh, advised by the um, FBI not to do so. So um, we're very, very happy and lucky that we see her back here at the Bali. We've spoken with her one and a half year ago. Um, uh, on a special occasion, um, on a, um, a Free Thinkers Festival we organized uh, for several years, uh, every year together with uh, uh, the city of Amsterdam and the mayor of Amsterdam. And it's very happy that we see her back now tonight. Um, we have a full program, uh, so I will hurry on. Uh, we have uh, Beri Shalmazi and Poyan Tamimi Arab. We'll speak about the present and the future of Iran. Um, at this moment, a live stream of the Bali is being attacked by uh, people from, the, uh, uh, from uh, outer space, let's call it like that, people <laughs> from the internet. So I hope we can uh, keep our viewers. Uh, we, at, at least we uh, make a tape of it so it's not, uh, um, uh, we can air it later otherwise. If it's, uh, if, I'm sorry, the viewers at home. Um, so, um, um, but first, um, I would like to give a warm, warm welcome to the mayor of Amsterdam, Femke Halsema, who will uh, introduce our evening. Femke Halsema. Good evening. If freedom could sing a song, the Iranian poet Ahmad Shamlu once wondered. It is well known that the Iranian authorities tried to kidnap and hurt Masi Alinejad. Nothing pleases me more than the fact that they failed. We all know why they want to hurt her. If I were a religious fanatic, I would also hunt down anyone who prefers the world's poetry and literature to reading only one holy book. If I were the head of a regime based on fear, I would also want to silence the most courageous people standing up to me. If I were a misogynist ayatollah who thinks that, is, that it is a sacred duty to tell women to shut up, then I would most certainly attempt to eliminate the woman who has rebelled against oppression since she was a young girl. The woman who, through her journalism, her writings and speeches, has been relentlessly attacking the regime for decades. The woman who has been the powerful, the powerful voice of a generation that strives to achieve what should have never been questioned in the first place. Not only in Iran, but worldwide, complete equality and absolute freedom for women. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Masi Alinejad back to Amsterdam. And of course, a special welcome to Masi's husband, Kambis Farouar. To, to, <laughs> and to tonight's audience, let me explain why I am so thrilled that Masi is back in Amsterdam. In 2021, the Bali organized a festival for free thinkers and invited Masi to speak. The Bali also invited Mohamed Oltslai, who is here also with us tonight. There he is. <laughs> who spent 14 years unjustly detained in Guantanamo Bay. Mohamed was denied a visa and could only attend online. But now Mohamed is living uh, here as an Amsterdammer. 
and he speaks Dutch. And he is spreading his message of tolerance amongst our city's youth. And now Massey is back, so we can persuade her and her husband to stay here as well. <laughs> so hopefully you can inspire the young people of Amsterdam with your free spirit, your courage, and your determ determination to fight for women's rights. But I realize it would be selfish to keep Massey only for Amsterdam, because she should focus on her work in keeping the world's attention on the struggle in Iran. On the 16th of September last year, Massa Amini, a 22-year-old Kurdish-Iranian woman, was beaten to death by the morality police for not wearing a headscarf properly. Her death sparked one of the largest waves of protest since the founding of the Islamic Republic. And Masih Alinejad is one of the most forceful spokespersons for this women-led movement. Although, of course, she was already a women's activi rights activist and vocal critic of the regime long before Amini's murder. This year, we commemorate with sadness that it has been exactly 40 years since the compulsory hijab was written into the penal code of the Islamic Republic. Masi has resisted this law from a very young age. Her rebellion against the regime, not surprisingly, led to an arrest and a sentence that was fortunately suspended. During her career as a journalist, Massey kept on calling the regime's leaders to account, reminding the people of their corruption and abuse of power. Since Massey has been living in the UK and the US, she has been an important figurehead and a source of inspiration for women in Iran and around the world. Dear Massey, when I said, we want you to become an Amsterdam, I was partly, partly joking, only partly. My biggest wish is not that you should stay in Amsterdam, but that one day you can see your parents again. And see them in a free and democratic Iran, where boys and girls can play together again, where youngsters can dance together and make music, where women can show what fantastic hair they have or choose freely to wear the hijab. If freedom could sing a song, Masi, you sing the song of freedom and we hear you. You are a great inspiration to many women and men in Amsterdam, especially members of the Iranian and Persian community here. And this, this is why the government of the city of Amsterdam has decided to honor you with an award. The Amsterdam pin, which is given to people who devote their time to society or display heroic behavior. It is not usually awarded to... Get used to it. Well, get used to it. <laughs> and let me just finish. It's not usually awarded to people outside the Netherlands, but for you, we are really honored to make an exemption. So please come. Speechless. I can only no, say, she's never speechless. Woman, I freedom! <laughs>
I told you that I feel home here. I feel like yes, you're part of my family members. I really appreciate that. And one day I'm going to invite you to my beautiful country, Iran. And I will come. <laughs> Iran. Thank yes, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, I'm speechless. Can I sit finally? Yeah. Come visit Iran again, Daddy. Because I didn't expect that. As I told you, I'm used to get nasty messages. You know, assassin in front of my house. People who want to kidnap me. Not a word. But thank you so much. Thank you, Netherlands. Thank you, Amsterdam. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Femke Halsma, for uh, this opening and for uh, uh, explaining who we have here, actually. So I don't need any further introduction, I think, uh, after this splendid introduction. Um, let's, uh, let's think. We, um, we have uh, had intensive days, so we have a, a few things to, to, to speak and discuss ab about. Um, uh, you must can be... I share my feeling to the Mayor? Yes, you can. Before of going to the let's, question. Yeah. That means a lot to me, not just because of me receiving that. I believe that this is, this is a gift to Iranian women. This is to, to brave Iranian women. I actually made the whole world to hear their voice. And you don't know why I got, yes, I dedicated this. I dedicated this to many women who lost their eyes. Many mothers who lost, yes, many mothers who lost their children. Many people who deserve to have a secular democracy, who deserve to have a mayor, who deserve to have government to appreciate them. The reason that I got emotional, because I want to see this in my own country. When you actually mention that, you have the dream for me to go back to Iran. I was looking into you know, with audiences, and I know that this is the dream of millions of Iranians to be together and be appreciated for what they have been doing. I dedicate this and tonight to the people of Iran, and thank you so much for making my night, the, I mean, best night ever here in Nevada. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for being here and, um, and, and for doing what you're doing. Um, and one and a half year ago, we spoke here in the same place, uh, and you said there will be the next big revolution in Iran uh, is coming, and it will be done by women. Uh, in September, uh, uh, a woman got killed. Uh, there's a huge outcry, a huge revolution. How, how did you know? I mean, we, we have no glass. You even cannot foresee the future. So what's, how did you know at that moment? It was a year and a half ago, yes, you're right, when I said that next revolution will be led by women. But four years ago at Stanford University, the headline of my talk was the same. And I'm going to be very honest with you. How many Iranians are here? How many of you knew that before, that there is going to be a revolution led by women, supported by men? So this is it. We know that. And that is why we have been warning. Uh, Yuri, I have to be honest with you. You were brave enough to actually invite me to come here when my campaign and the campaign of Iranian women against compulsory hijab was not that popular. We were the one actually people labeling us, saying that you're causing Islamophobia. We were the one that people telling us that you know, we go to your country, we wear hijab out of respect to your culture. And we, the women of Iran, were the one actually frustrating and just being furious, didn't know how to explain to the rest of the world that being oppressed or receiving lashes or being bitten up by morality police, it's not part of our culture. This is the culture of morality police. This is the culture of ISIS. This is the culture of Taliban. This is the culture of Islamic Republic. Our culture is just tolerance. 
Look back our history, 40 years ago, women had the freedom to choose what they wanted to wear. So that is why I believe that we Iranian knew that. So and are you saying also um, that, uh, uh, and we saw that, you know, a lot of people uh, agree with you that, you know, we, you know, not we, you know, yeah? uh, you Iranians and you. Um, are you saying maybe in a way, uh, 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 we didn't know because uh, uh, we didn't know that it was a problem that Women were suppressed, it's it looked away. I'm being that honest and straight, yeah. yes. Yeah. The Westerners, oh my God, I just received an award from the West. So I, I, <laughs> I, shouldn't, I shouldn't ruin that, I shouldn't ruin that. Yeah. No, I mean, as I mentioned, both of you and your community, you allowed me to, wait a minute. I received this award tonight, exactly the night that I was canceled by one of the organization who actually invited me, who canceled me because they found out I'm being around with three bodyguards and the Islamic Republic trying to kill me and they said that we are worried for the attendees. We are worried for those people who are gonna come and listen to you, maybe they are in danger. Thank you so much for coming and not being scared. And yeah. That's the message. That's, I'm gonna get back to your question, but I have a lot in he, my heart, I have to. So the thing is, one of the well-known painter actually came to me and said that I wanna paint four or five uh, people who are my heroes, and then I was one of them got canceled. Why? Because she said that I have two, two small children, and I found out that- She, she has two small, the, the painter. The painter mm -hmm. said that she has two small ch children, and she found out that I'm the most wanted one by the government. They wanna kill me, they wanna assassinate me, they wanna kidnap me, and she said that, so, you know, I'm worried for my two small children. One of the news agencies in America invited me to go there and said, oh, we just found out on the news that you're being followed by someone who wanna kill you. Can you just stay, I have to, you know, and I was like, you have to one cancel the, the terrorists, of, not me. One of the major news yeah. uh, networks in America? AP invited me to do an interview, and then uh, that was the day the news was everywhere, like uh, one of the guy with loaded gun got arrested in front yeah, of the, my there, house. There's this Azeri yeah. criminals in front of your door. He yeah. was a scary as well, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, I, I saw his picture, yeah. really. He like, didn't even need the gun to kill me. He could have just, <laughs> you know? But the thing is, the thing is, my message is here. Thank you for not canceling those who are the victim of terrorist government. You have to cancel terrorists and their bodies and their apologies who are here in Netherlands and bypassing the sanctions. <laughs> no? And what was your question? <laughs> what was your question? This is all because the question... <laughs> So because the, and it's answered. The question is how you know how did you know and you know how and that was the, and and maybe we didn't we didn't know because we looked away. We didn't want to know. Not That's only very that, because some of the Western government. I'm being very honest. I got my award and I have to be honest, because some of the politicians from your country who bowed to the killers. I don't want to name her because I, I, I still think that she's a powerful woman and she can be an ally for us. It's not late if you hear me. But when you wear hijab in front of the Islamic Republic, it means you empowering the terrorists to kill Mahsa Amini. Yeah. So why? Still, I didn't answer your question. I'm going to do it. Why? Because some of the politicians, they choose business over democracy. Yeah, um, uh, uh, some of the politicians might do, uh, and businessmen uh, for sure do. Uh, um, uh, and there are many Dutch businessmen who are still in, in investing in it. And that, but it's another. But also, politicians say that it's important to, because we have diplomatic ties, uh, uh, to uh, uh, tell the Iranian government uh, how things should be. And if you have, don't have uh, uh, diplomatic ties, and if you don't go there, you know, nobody will listen to you. I hope you don't believe in that, but thank you for challenging me and giving me the opportunity to actually answer to this argument. You're absolutely right, because I keep hearing that from many politicians, you keep hearing that, that we should not isolate the Islamic Republic because yeah. we have to negotiate with them and solve and, and, and look bigger happened, problems. And look what happened to North Korea. They're isolated and, yeah. Iran is going to be North Korea even having the diplomatic relation with the Islamic Republic. Why? I'm gonna tell you. Two decades. 
the Western government actually spent the resources of the Western people to get a nuclear deal, to negotiate with the Islamic Republic, to keep this diplomatic relation, what have you achieved? What have you achieved? Nothing, because Islamic Republic is cheating, hiding the nuclear enrichment. Islamic Republic is lying. And Islamic Republic doesn't understand the language of diplomacy. Their language, their diplomacy is hostage taking. Their diplomacy is actually um, spreading their ideology here in Netherlands. Believe me, if you want to actually have an Iran, a government without any, no, if you want to have an Iran without nuclear bomb, you have to actually respect Iranians' revolution who wants to have an Iran without the Islamic Republic. With the Islamic Republic, it's not going to happen because right now, Swedish citizen, Netherlands citizen. I mean, you were in the meeting with me with the prime minister. I mean, I'm not going to say anything bad because still I have hope that he's going to deliver his promise. He was very honest with me in some part that he couldn't promise me. He said, I cannot do that. But in some part, especially putting the Revolutionary Guards in the terrorist list, he promised me that he's going to push the EU to do that. Yeah. He did. He did. Um, no, but he you, was you concerned. But he was concerned, sure. Tell and, me about his concern. And he, um, uh, he, uh, <laughs> he, he was concerned, and, he, and I, I believe, I, I thought that he was very honest with that, that um, the Iranian government would kill people who are in prison. Exactly. Uh, uh, and so the take him hostage in a way, uh, emotionally, because, uh, uh, and he felt for that. That was obvious. It was not, um, uh, but he was afraid to uh, uh, speak out too loud uh, uh, because of those hostages. That's right. That's what, that's, what exactly President Macron told me, that Prime Minister Rutte actually said that, my pronunciation is correct? Rute? Yes, it's, it's quite accurate. Because you know, yeah. I'm used to it, people butcher my name a lot, Mashi, Mashi. So I don't want to- They mash it around, yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, but Mr. Prime Minister told me that if, uh, if he uh, is, you know, being tough with the Islamic Republic, they might hurt the you know, citizens of Europe, Europe who are in prison. They, the Islamic Republic might hurt the hostages. I actually have so much respect for him, President Macron, who cares about the citizens, especially coming from a country where our government doesn't care about us killing us. So much respect. But saying that, my family is hostage in Iran. They put my brother in prison. The family members of these activists Iranians are hostage in Iran. 18 million people are hostage in Iran. We don't bow to the hostage takers. And I want the leaders of democratic countries not by the hostage taking diplomacy. Because if you actually send monies to them, or you say, okay, because you have hostage and you are using them like bargaining chip, then I'm gonna be easy on you, so they're gonna take more, more hostages. It's gonna send them a signal that we don't do any, we, the Islamic Republic don't receive any punishment, then there is no reason for them to stop taking hostage. So that's my point. Right now, my dream is that. Let me share my dream if you're happy, honestly support that, because President is gonna just listen to, uh, President Macron and um, Prime Minister, they're gonna listen to, the, to this. There is one solution. U.S. citizen is in prison, U.K. citizen, U.S. citizen, British citizen, uh, German citizen, French citizen, all of them are in prison. They're being used like bargaining chip. One solution for that, all the leaders of these countries, they must get united and downgrade their diplomatic relation with the Islamic Republic, recall their ambassadors, kick out the Islamic Republic diplomats, and ask them to release all the innocent political prisoners. This is how diplomacy works. I but in the, we're here and listen to this because it's but the in, dream of us. But in, uh, you, uh, I, I was so impressed by the way you uh, uh, addressed the prime minister. I was impressed by the prime minister as well, though. But um, me too. But um, you, in the meantime, we have seen an uprising. Um, must have been terrible for you also not to be there and have to watch that from abroad. For all I, of us, I, I imagine. Um, but it looks like, it, to me at least, if I'm following the news that um, the Iranian regime um, uh, succeeded in uh, beating it down? Not at all. 
This is what I actually said to uh, Prime Minister, who I was impressed when he actually said woman, life, freedom. He knew this slogan. He knew how to actually recognize this, um, which we call it a revolution, because the Islamic Republic knows how to mislead the rest of the world and how to use intense violence to push people back behind the curtains. But this is just the beginning, just the beginning of the end, and we Iranians know that. People are actually preparing themselves for the next phase of the revolution, because you know that revolution have different phases. One phase was massive protests across Iran. Second phase, we have to get ready with a plan with united opposition uh, to make the leaders of democratic countries to be united as well. Now the burden is on our shoulder. We cannot say that uh, because people are not in the streets and facing guns and bullets and rapes and shot in the eyes, so the revolution is dead. When people were in the street getting killed, 500 people got killed. What, why the Western government didn't actually do anything? And now they're saying that, okay, the revolution is dead. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that because I believe that we have faced 2019 protests. Aban Khunin, bloody November. The internet was shut down. The government killed 1,500 innocent people. What happened? It's dead? No. People got back to the street. And this wave is heavier than, you know, one. And the last one, yeah. So the next wave is going to be heavier to you, end the Islamic Republic. You showed a little um, uh, uh, movie on your um, uh, social media uh, uh, this week. We have it here. Um, uh, and well, let's, let's have a look at it. Oh, sure. Um. Yes, the revolution is alive. Oh. You see, I couldn't even translate this because this is very brave. Khamenei, definite Mikoni, we bury you. This the woman got free out of prison. A second after getting free from prison, she actually, I love the way this mother explaining to the mayor. Yeah. <laughs> I love you. You know, that, the flame of the revolution is burning. As far as these women are there, we, the women of Iran, we became like nightmare for this regime. We're not gonna let them go. We're gonna actually, I mean, this is not like me saying that here. You hurt her. There are women in Iran, Ghazal, Nilufar, Rahele. These women were shot in their eyes. I have to name men as well. Reza, Hossein, Saman. These people, you see that all of them being blinded. But you know what scares the regime? They all show victory. They all have a smile on their face. If this is not a revolution, then what do you call it? <laughs> The, the regime has fallen inside our heart. We just need push from Western government to accept that. <laughs> because what we saw here is a woman coming out of prison after five being locked up for five years. And uh, her name, if I pronounce it rightly, um, uh, Sepide Golian. Um, I think it's important to name names. Uh, that's, that's what I feel, because a lot of time when I actually want to name people who've been wounded, who've been killed and tortured, I say to the Western uh, journalists that please think about it. When George Floyd got killed in America brutally, people were saying his name. But people in the Middle East, when we get killed, we're like a statistics, we're like numbers to the Western you know, media and Western government. No, thank you so much for naming. And I want to actually name Sarina, Nika. You know, many of these teenagers who got killed, now you see their family members. Many people in, in like Mahsa's family members, they are actually saying that this revolution needs blood. And that's why our beloved ones sacrificed their life. Puya Bakhtiari is another one. He was hand in hand with Nahid Shirpiche, his mother. Both of them joined Iran protests. What happened? Puya got killed, shot in the head in front of his mother. Guess what happened? Now his mother is in prison because 
She said that loudly, I am alive. I am here to bring the Islamic Republic down. This is the true heroes of mine and many Iranians. I wish Western female politicians who go to Iran were as brave as Nahid Shirpisha and Sepida and other women. You know, taking off their hijab and saying that you are terrorists, we're not gonna recognize you, we're not gonna legitimize you. I saw many politicians here in the West, they bowed to Taliban and they covered their hair as well. And don't get me wrong, I don't have any problem with this. My mother wear hijab. My dream is to shoulder, walk shoulder to shoulder with my mother, with her own hijab without getting killed. M women in Zahedan, with hijab, every Friday they're taking to the street and saying, with or without hijab, let's move forward this revolution. But this is a symbol when it's in the hand of Taliban and Islamic Republic, the Western female politicians can be our allies and say no to Taliban, no to Islamic Republic, and yes to revolution in Iran. Yes. Honestly, invite the foreign minister next time with me. She was arrested really the, the, sort of immediately after uh, she was yeah. shouting and she's in prison again. And you're saying, um, uh, yes, but it's on the streets, it's still there, it's a revolution. And it's, but then you also said it's also on us and us is the, is the outside world, is the Iranians outside because you- Every you, single of us. Yeah, and, and, and everybody. I mean, not only Iranians in exile, but, but on the other hand, you uh, founded the charter, the Masa charter, just very, very recently. What is it? Why is it important? Because the Islamic Republic tried for 40 years to sell this narrative to the rest of the world that we don't have United 41 opposition. years, that's right? 43 yeah. years. 43, yeah. Yeah, 43. 43 years. <laughs> Thank you so much for following your past. You know, many of many, many Iranians here, when I was the one actually had hope on reformists, they were the ones saying no to Islamic Republic. So for four decades, we have actually uh, seen that the Islamic Republic survive because of having divided opposition. So this is for the first time. I mean, the Islamic Republic always put the blame on different group. They even called the, Kurd, the Kurds separatists. The Kurds become the symbol of solidarity, the symbol of unity. The moment when Mahsa got killed in Kurdistan, Kurds, instead of like mourning, crying, they turned the funeral to a massive protest against the regime because they were the first group they said no to Khomeini. So they said, Jinjian Azadi, right after that, across Iran, from Kurdistan to Zahedan, everywhere, everywhere, people got united. So now this is time for us outside Iran to be united. Uh, so that is why recently we, some different political leaders from monarchies to those who believe in a presidential system, left and right, you know, to Kurds or, and, and um, human rights activists, not Nobel Peace Prize winner, the son of the last Shah of Iran. Um, I wanna name them all, but we got united. We we're just a small group of massive, Iranians outside Iran who say no to Islamic Republic uh, and, and uh, trying to say to the democratic countries that we are united, we are ready to have an Iran without Islamic Republic and you must be ready, you must be united, have a unified voice in Europe, in America to accept an Iran without Islamic Republic which benefit Europe and other countries in the West as well. Believe me, we the people of Iran are better allies than these backward mullahs for you and... <laughs> it's probably a very good point. Um, uh, it's not only in the interest of the Iranians, it's in the interest of everybody here. Yeah. This is what I tried yeah. actually yeah. when the members of parliament, thank to them by partisan, uh, they invited me to listen to what's Earlier going today, on. Earlier today, yeah. Yeah, I said the same thing, that I'm not here to ask you to save us. Actually, we want to save the rest of the world from one of the most dangerous virus <laughs> called the Islamic Republic. Because it's benefit the West. But in the past, one of the problems might have been that the opposition towards the regime of Ayatollah Khomeini and his um, uh, successors um, was so divided that there was no opposition. Um, 
to millions of us. I mean, look, dictators like Putin, like Maduro, mm -hmm. like China, Khamenei, they're really good at actually um, making their own opposition divided by spreading fake information, disinformation, by actually uh, putting pressure on the family members, by assassinating the true leaders and putting true leaders in prison and killing them abroad. So they try to divide us. But as I said that, the time has come for all the oppositions and Iranians who believe like in different political views to put their differences aside and come around one common goal, which is fair and free election. When the Islamic Republic is gone, the kind of the government that we want to have, it's up to the future and we can vote for it under, you know, when, when the um, Islamic Republic is bye bye, when they are gone. No, I'm saying bye bye to Khamenei. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> this is the only way. This is a common goal for all Iranians, no? And it should be a common goal for all democratic countries because Islamic Republic, of course, is an ISIS with oil. And when they are in power, not just me. Yes, these are Iranians. Not just me saying And there are that. some parliamentarians down I know. there. Yeah. <laughs> none of the Europeans, none of the Europeans, they're going to benefit from the Islamic Republic. When Islamic Republic is gone, you're going to have better economic. You're going to have better security. Because look, this is now Khamenei and Revolutionary Guards sending drones to who? To Putin, to kill innocent Ukrainians. But I don't get it that the democratic countries uh, actually isolating Putin. But when it comes to Khamenei, another warmonger, they say, OK, well, you know, I myself, alongside, alongside President Zelensky, I receive an award, courage award to say no to Putin and Khamenei. We receive, sh sh I mean, common award, but not common and same support from Western countries. And that's wrong, because we are fighting all together against same battle. When Putin and Khamenei is united, we must be united as well. I'm not tired. <laughs> so, um Today, we uh, uh, were in the parliament. You were invited by the parliament to speak to, uh, uh, indeed, from left to right. Um, uh, you spoke to our prime minister yesterday. Uh, you spoke to our minister of justice uh, today. Um, you spoken to uh, uh, President Macron uh, uh, last year, at the end of last year. Um, why is it important to speak to Western politicians? Because to human rights is universal. Look, I remember when, uh, because this is very, very, very simple. You are not free. None of you are free in Europe when women of Iran and Afghanistan are not free. Very good. That's it. And why? And why? And why? Well, talking to Western leaders is important. Because this is not us need the Western leaders to help us to survive. Believe me, this is the Islamic Republic begging the Western countries to help them to survive. So Khamenei and his gang of killers, it means that they say death to America, they say that we are anti-West and the ideology of the Western countries, all their children and relatives are here, are at the, in the United States of America. And promoting them and trying to get a nuclear deal from the Western countries. So you see, that is why I believe that the Western leaders, which I, in my meeting, when I go and meet with the leaders of democratic countries, I clearly say that you have to stop helping the Islamic Republic. I, want, I don't want you to help us, I want you to help democracy. Because the Western leaders say that we are all for human rights for equality, for feminism. No, you cannot just say that and then go and bow to one of the most anti-women government who rape women, who kill women, who torture women, who actually uh, don't even see us as a human being. They, not even me. Uh, Ibrahim Raisi and Rouhani, actually Khamenei, all the killers, when they meet with the leaders of democratic countries, they actually want to use you for their own benefits. So by legitimizing them, you are ruining the democracy in Europe as well. So for the benefit of democracy, 
if you claim that you are democratic countries, you have to support pro-democracy movement in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you have to face terrorists on your own soil. Believe me. They are like virus. They will infect the rest of the world. They are deadlier than coronavirus. I think you have more than 20 minutes. I was um, very impressed when you said, in a very concise way, um, um, I'm not here uh, uh, to ask your help. I'm just here to stop helping the regime. Yeah, because and we know how to overthrow the regime. Yeah. I know that democratic countries are scared of the word regime change. As Kalame regime change, me Tarsan. There are Persian here. Let me speak a little bit Persian. In Vazife Most, in Vazife Most, Mozahm Khurde in Hukumati, Mommelet Zahmi Hastim, but Boya Tak Takamon. Tap of Tomuna Kenorbaz in Bibinit Bakish Vare, Arbi Moramibinan Chimigan, Migan Shoma Hanus Hotu Midun in Chimikan. Do you want? Uh, a secular democracy, we say yes, and they say, so where are you? Who we can talk? You can say all of us because we are united to bring down this regime and we deserve to have secular democracy and dignity and freedom the way that you take it for granted because the color of my skin is different than uh, Western feminists or Western women. That doesn't mean when I get kicked out from a stadium, it's normal. That doesn't mean when I get kicked out and lashes, it's normal. When, oh my God. The Handmaid's Tale. No, no, I have to finish that. I have to finish. There is a series called Handmaid's Tale, Nadime. So you know why? It hurts. It hurts a lot when I see that in the West people eat their popcorns and watch this as an entertainment. Then a white woman get raped, get lashes, get hanged in entertainment movie. Your entertainment? is our reality in Iran and Afghanistan. My women are getting killed. Yeah, I get frustrated when I cannot actually, it has been year, eight years when I launched my campaign since that there is no female politician that you can find be as brave as Sarina, as brave as Nika, as brave as Ghazal, as brave as Azadeh, as brave as Hanane, as brave as, there are many names. So, yeah, you understand me. <laughs> I do. You understand. I do. And I think a lot of people here do, actually, probably almost everybody. I think, I, I, let's uh, 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 stop here. Um, I think one of the most, one of the many, many powerful things you said tonight and also today to the politicians and yesterday is what's the difference, gender apartheid or South African apartheid? Honestly, <laughs> I said that I say beautiful things, they don't take it serious. <laughs> Thank you very, very of much, Mazi, Mazi Alina Jab. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to listen to the choir uh, again. Humaya, yeah, that's right. Ah.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I will now ask uh, Biri Salmazi and Poyan Tamimi Arab to join me. Um, please both um, come to the podium. Masi is over there. There's a chair for the mayor. That's a good thing. No, 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 no. That's uh, stay there. That's great. Um, uh, uh, if if you want to join in, uh, we know where you are. And, no, I um, love this. This is the Persian culture. Because we need something to get it. 
<laughs> no, no, no. But um, uh, uh, you're, you're comfortable there, and if we want, if we need you, I call you for the conversation. Yeah. Um, um, Biri Shamasi is a, uh, you are a filmmaker and author, um, uh, uh, welcome, um, as assistant, as a you're a consultant at the Netherlands Film Fund, but um, you're a filmmaker in your own right, in, uh, and really so, you won a silver camera, a silver camera. Um, you recently ret you returned from the Iraq-Iranian border um, because uh, you made a film uh, for Frontlini, um, we have a fragment of that, but maybe, maybe just maybe before that, um, uh, if you, um, we're going to uh, look to a fragment of the of your film uh, uh, right now. But um, what I understood from Masi in many uh, different ways is that the genie is out of the bottle. Uh, it's the, it's it's really uh, uh, overboiling now. Um, is that uh, would you would you say the same? Hundred percent the same. Um, just like Masha, uh, just like, I'm so sorry, um, just like uh, Masi and a lot of people in the room, I think everyone, I've been observing uh, the revolution from afar, although it feels like we're inside it continuously, and I needed to feel the fire with my own hands. And obviously none of us are allowed, even if we want to or can in any way enter Iran. So I did the closest thing possible. I went and looked them in the eye, the border guards, the mountains, everything you can see from the other side of the border I saw. But the most important thing that I found and brought back and that we're gonna see a little bit of is people who were there Generation Z who was on the streets, who was there, they were there in the first protest in Sakhas, Gina's hometown. They were there in the image that we see behind us. They were there in the terrible images that they filmed for us until they could no longer be there and they had to flee. And now they're in Iraqi Kurdistan, on the other side of the border, trying to find a new way to continue their fight. And that's where I found them. So I felt like the genie is definitely out of the bottle, but if you would call it a fire, I touched the fire with my own hands and I'm here to show you it hurts, but in a good way, because I know we're gonna get somewhere. A fire is a very Kurdish thing as well, and it's, it's very positive. It's very thing, Kurdish right? and it's very Noros. All of us celebrate the new year uh, saying goodbye to the evil, jumping over fire. So it's in our soul, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it, it hurts, but in a good way. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Poyan, um, uh, uh, assistant professor at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies in the University of Utrecht. Um, you combine uh, research, uh, social scientific approaches with uh, philosophy and your um, uh, uh, research uh, on secularization with uh, Hamam, and that's uh, the group for analy analyzing and measuring attitudes in Iran. Um, and with that, you won in uh, last year, actually, the President's Medal uh, uh, of the Market Research Society in London. Um, congratulations with that, of course, but, um, and, but it's also important because um, uh, uh, later on, we're going to listen to uh, uh, some scientific evidence, I would say, on what the mood is in Iran. And it's important to stress that this is not just, you know, this sort of research. It's a uh, research which got a presidential medal. So that's why I want to point it out. That, you know, because a lot of people will say, ah, there's, you know, there's fake news. And, and, and so it's important. Um, uh, I, I get back to you a little bit later. We're going to first look at a fragment of your movie, Beri. Yes. really um, moving, if you see that. Um, those, well, first, first, maybe back to the, the fragment of the school. Um, that's a fragment you didn't film yourself, isn't it? Exactly, but, but also, Yuri, before we continue, I want to say a little thing. Thank Please. you so much for and the city of Amsterdam and our mayor for hosting this here because it's incredible to have these important 
uh, democratic conversations in our hometown out of everywhere. So thank you for that, really. But also, Masi, can you please come and join us? Because part of the democratic conversation is the enjoyment of Pleasure. being able to talk together. Thank you. This is Persian mom's culture, taking the chair for her yes. daughter. May I make a very small remark? Yes, you can, of course. That's so, why you're here, um, and also Barry, a longer one. <laughs> what I understood is that Barry asked the mayor, right after uh, Mahsa was killed, to place her image on the Eye Film Museum. And I actually moved to North, so I, I used the ferry. And I grew up in Amsterdam. But very often, people like us, we feel very lonely still, even though we grew up here. You always, we have friends, we have family there. And what the mayor did by placing the image there on the uh, museum, it just um, makes people like us feel less lonely. Yeah, I think a couple of times I only went up there to just look at it and feel like, wow, this city is actually my home. Thank you so much for that. So, sorry, Yuri, we're going to go this all, is all the way around and then come back to where you were at. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think um, uh, uh, that's part of the conversation. It's part of what we... Um, uh, so, thanks a lot. Um, um, it's part of the conversation about why... and you. Uh, explained that very, um, very eloquently. Um, it's about our democracy. It's not only about you know, uh, people in the Middle East. It's about what we believe is democracy is and can do. Exactly. And, uh, and that this conversation is as much about that as it is about a, a, a faraway country. You know? <laughs> so uh, uh, thank you. Um, you, back. You, were, you were at the to, school, and yeah, you yeah. asked me, is this, did you film this? And then I took a detour, and then yeah. Puyan took another detour. That's where we were. You're right. Um, but you didn't yeah, film you that. Le you left Puyan behind, yes. and Puyan is my son's name. So I, ha I want to give all time involved. to Puyan. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I, I, we will be uh, uh, listening to, to him in a, in a moment. Um, uh, but the... Fragment of the schoolgirls. You found it somewhere? Yes, and to explain, I think a lot of us, well, for, let's talk for myself, I think every image that has been out there is in my head like a film. You can ask me, Billy, do you know this girl that was doing this and that? I'll be like, oh, that was end of October in this city, and I'll find it for you. And this image, spe specifically the one at the end, where they are really booing off uh, an official from their school ground, when I saw that, that's the moment I knew there is no return. Because the group of people, young girls, who uh, is oppressed in so many ways, and they have to look at these guys, their images, every day in their school books, at the walls, everywhere, they lost power. When they put up their middle finger, when they stepped on the books, when they shouted at this man, this is when I knew if our generation can do it, if my generation can do it, they will do it. There's no return. As we say in film, this is the point of no return. So it's found footage, or it's anonymous footage, because all of the images from the revolution, what they film is dangerous, but the people who film it are just as much as dangerous. Like friends of mine who film in Kurdistan send me footage, and you see their phones drop because they are hit by bullets while filming it. So that, that's the pressure there is on this material. So it's a little bit maybe like as a filmmaker, you have your name and credit everywhere, but everything goes uncredited uh, in this revolution. Like this image we see, it's everywhere, but no one knows the name of the person who took it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's. And that anonymity stems, of course, from the repression. It stems from the repression, 100%. And also, it's the last bit of um, safety or fake safety that you can keep for yourself. And 
uh, when we talk about names and uh, stuff like that, I, I need to say one thing, uh, and everyone can say it the way they want, but if we're going to mention names, especially for me as a Kurdish Iranian woman, I have to say it's Gina Amini. And I know for a lot of people it has grown into Masha because also the hashtag and everything. And I understand people, really I understand, but if we're going to honor names, please try and say Gina Amini. Her name means life, for God's sake. In, in Kurmanji. In Kurdish, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, but the... The, then I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit more on the on your movie and on what you're uh, what you're saying. Um, the, the 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 astonishing thing is um, in the conversation we just had in the uh, in the footage we're seeing uh, you found and you put into uh, your movie. Um, the astonishing thing is sort of the lack of consciousness about the fact that. Um, this is done in the first part uh, in, in a very bad way to women, and that sort of went unnoticed you know, for a very, very forty-three years. It's 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 puzzling in a way because we are so emancipated. It, so, worse than unnoticed, uh, it went accepted, and mm -hmm. that's worse than unnoticed. And that's why, as you were mentioning before. One and a half year ago, people were like, oh, what, what is she talking about, right, kind of. And now it's like, oh, if the people of Iran risk their lives to tell us this, then, oh, all of a sudden we see it. Because it didn't go unnoticed. We all know. And that's also what the regime feared, of course. There's a reason they tried to, and you'll see that in the movie if you watch it, uh, they tried to confuse people where Gina's body was going to be taken, for example, because they know if the, it's hard to protest, at least it's a little bit easier to show up at the funeral. But people found out through social, social media and because it, everything is so well documented in social media, and they showed up. And um, as Massey mentioned before, that turned into the first protest. So... Uh, let's remember, because I'm sure we're unaware of different situations elsewhere in the world, it's not that we didn't know, it's we didn't, we didn't show up for these people. Well, not we, we, like, especially our community tried, but we were unheard. And now, now we know, now you all know, so you need, need to stick around and stay with us, please. Um, and then there's these young women uh, uh, with uh, uh, in, uh, in arms uh, on the, just the other side of the border, and um, um, is there going to be? Uh, um, are they going to be successful with their weapons? Is is that? I mean, Masi is saying we need to have a democratic, secular uh, 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 regime change, but but in a um, non-violent way. If I uh, yeah. If I'm wrong, uh, correct me. But and, and yeah, and, and the, you're gonna say like, what are they gonna do with these weapons, right? Yeah, uh, nothing. Is, is it, they're not. They're not gonna do anything with these weapons. And to be honest, I wondered myself because uh, why do you look like this? Why do you carry this? You have to watch the film to figure out. But also, um, why do they do this? Because they are uh, the newest recruits of movements that have been active against the regime in Iran for decades. And this is how you recognize them. Uh, I asked them, what are you going to do with the weapons? And they said, we're not going to do anything because it's not our uh, place to show up there. It's the people inside Iran where they were, and they were those people themselves. They have to do this, and no one is going to interfere, no weapons whatsoever. It's more a symbol, so the regime remembers, hey, this is the people we are trying to uh, make disappear. We kill their leaders in Europe, we kill them in Iraq, but you can't, you can't kill um, hope. And this is why they still carry this, so the enemy, the opponent, the dictatorship is reminded that this struggle has been going on for decades and will go on as long as needed. So it's a symbolic um, thing. 
Because is... Revolutionary Guards has the weapon, the real weapon, and it's not symbolic at all. <laughs> Let's get, stick to the main, <laughs> and uh, people are unarmed in Iran. Their weapon is like their camera, their mobile phone, and that's what, their social media. And that is why they're really scared of the power of social media. Khamenei actually banned 80 million Iranians from using Instagram, Twitter. Can you believe that? Like, it, it, it's, it's just, you know, using Facebook is a crime. Using Instagram is a crime. But how ironic, the tech companies, social media tech companies, allowing the same dictators who ban 18 million Iranians to use freedom of speech on the same platform. Kick them out. I mean, this is the, pla this is, they're not the, I mean, honestly, Kuyan, you have to speak. Yeah. We, the okay. women, we're not going to let you this. speak. <laughs> it's, it's nice for a change, <laughs> though. <laughs> I, I, I talk too much, so it's okay. You know what's nice about the internet? Like people have been texting me from inside that they are watching tonight as well. How powerful is that? That's a good. That's good to hear because that tells us that uh, they, they're still trying to bombard our uh, our internet side. Good. That they, they didn't succeed in that. So that's good to hear. Um, We asked you to uh, put together a, a sort of uh, a presentation on the mood in Iran. Uh, um, and I think that's very important in this conversation. So we asked you to uh, get some uh, um, uh, um, statistics out. And yes. So please. Thank you. Oh, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> that was a plan. Sorry about that. I felt guilty for you. <laughs> OK, sorry about that. I always want to be no, fair okay. to men, especially. We need them. <laughs> Do I press right? For years, statistics, Matthew says, we're not numbers. But statistics, surveys, have legitimized the Iranian regime. For instance, a 2013 Pew Research Center survey claimed that 83% of Iranians supported Sharia law in the Constitution. A Gallup <coughs> survey conducted after the sham elections of Ebrahim Raisi in 2021 claimed he's astronomically popular. Now, we at Gaman knew that conventional survey modes, like on-site interviews and telephone interviews, don't work in Iran. Many people are just too frightened to give their true opinions about such politically sensitive topics. That's why we conduct online surveys, the rationale being that non-representative data can still be attempted to be made representative through waiting, whereas, if people don't answer truthfully, nothing the researcher does can make the results valid. Now, a survey we conducted before the protests in February 2022 showed that Iranians don't agree with a theocratic system. Our survey sample sizes run in the 10,000s, and for this particular survey, we made use of Siphon VPN next to distributing the link on various social media pages and channels. Siphon is a free app that allows people to connect to the unfiltered internet. Millions of people use it. And we found that collaborating with Siphon helps us in getting samples from harder to reach groups, such as women, people in rural areas, and also regime proponents. At the time, Siphon sent the link to 620,000 unique desktop and mobile devices inside Iran. After the waiting, using demographic variables such as age, sex, and the province people live in, we found that around 70% explicitly disagreed with having a political system governed by religious law. Young and old, men and women, people in rural and urban areas, and those with and without a university education. Um. Not going. Oh. I need to. Pre 
not press so. The decon? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah. So we also found, this is before the protests, that 65% support nationwide strikes and that around half the population at the time thought civil disobedience and street protests are a good way to bring about political change. So given the protests in 2017, and then again in 2019, and given such numbers, the outburst of revolutionary sentiments following Gina Amini's death should have surprised precisely nobody. And still, some journalists cast doubt on the nationwide character of the protests. Despite unpredictable internet limitations, we were able, fortunately, to conduct a survey on the protests in the last days of December. The survey link was spread to a variety of apps such as WhatsApp and Instagram. Siphon sent the link to a near 400,000 unique mobile and desktop devices spread across Iran. And this time, the satellite television channels Iran International and Voice of America Persian also broadcasted an ad that's showing now on the screen to participate in the survey. Over 157,000 people inside Iran filled out the survey. But I know what you're thinking, right? Yeah, but is it representative? So let's look at three tests to confirm whether it's representative. And yeah, <clears throat> this table, which is uh, based on official data coming from Iran itself, shows household income levels divided into so-called deciles, dividing the income levels into 10 parts of 10%. In the middle, you can see our representative sample. That's the one that says sample after matching and raking. Now, how do you know it's representative? it has to be 10% for each decile. So you see we have 12, then 8, then 8.8, .8, 7. It's all nearly 10. And the last four are added together at the bottom. That's 40, right? This means two things. It means the data from Iran is actually true. And it means that our survey is capturing people of all socioeconomic layers in that society. We compared our results also with those of Ethnologue. That's an institute based in the United States that has researched which languages people speak in Iran. And you can see that our results closely resemble those of Ethnologue, showing that people of different ethnicities are participating. So, you know, we had 68% for Farsi, for example. It should be 63. Kurdish, we had 6.5, but should be 5.8, and so on and so forth. And there are even some regime-backed polls that we can use. For example, when they're not asking politically sensitive questions. We compared our results on people's health insurance with those of ISPA, which is a regime-backed polling agency in Tehran, and the results are close to those of ISPA. Even, you can see, for example, the armed forces insurance, the regime pollster said it's 3.4, we had 2.9. So even for a very small group that has armed forces insurance, it's there, right? So, I mean, this is, this is amazing, uh, just to be clear. In survey land world, this is, this is crazy. Um, so the re survey results are, in other words, highly reliable. Because people answered questions anonymously, we can be more sure that they gave their true opinions. Yeah? So what are those opinions? We found that in December 2022, 80% explicitly said they do not want an Islamic Republic. If they could vote in a free referendum on the current political system, they would vote no. Comparing three survey results, we found a huge increase, that's the red line you see going up, in the people who completely gave up on the idea that this regime can be reformed, with 60% explicitly agreeing with the idea of regime change, and another 16% agreeing with a transition away from the Islamic Republic. We also found that people are infuriated by the regime's brutal violence. 
the percentage of those who say they would support revolutionary executions of regime officials doubled to 16% compared to a survey we conducted in 2020. And this anger was the highest amongst people under 30 years old and, unsurprisingly, women. Now, some academics cite a cooling down of protest activity or insufficiently impactful strikes to claim that Iranians don't believe, so to claim something about what they believe, right? to claim that they don't believe a revolution can succeed. In contrast, in survey research conducted after the protests in December 2022, we found that revolutionary anger was mixed with hope with two out of three expressing the belief that the protests can succeed. No doubt the romanticism of revolutionary sentiments can cloud judgment, but the majority of Iranians inside and outside the country do support reasonable steps to cooperate across political divides. Chants such as woman life liberty originating in the Kurdish population, and from Zahedan to Tehran, I sacrificed my life for Iran, heard in the downtrodden province of Sistan and Baluchistan, capture a desire to achieve a democratic Iran that is inclusive. But what can the West do? Some answers from our survey report. Over 70% agrees with proscribing the IRGC as a terrorist organization agrees with expelling Iran's ambassadors. Over 60% agrees with ending negotiations to revive the nuclear deal, while 12% says they have no opinion. 73% thinks the West should seriously pressure the regime. These numbers confirm that in her many speeches and interviews, Masih Ali Nejad is mediating what the majority of Iranians want. They want the West to recognize their revolution, to cut ties with the regime, and to concentrate all efforts on empowering the people. Without even knowing your speech, I supported you. Thank you. It was phenomenal. Thank you. It's a small group of the, uh, the society are ruling the country. Yes, they say often that Iran is polarized, or at least they used to try to say that, right? You know, the Minister of Foreign Affairs at the time, Zarif, would say, oh, we have high turnout rates. People participate in elections. 70% turnout rates for Rouhani, right? But what we found in 2019 is that the overwhelming majority who said I voted for Rouhani, also said that in a f truly free referendum, they would not go for reform. They would just vote the Re Islamic Republic away. Right? And that means that Iran is not a polarized society in that sense. Right? We have a very large majority that's kind of the hostage of a, uh, what you call backward uh, Mullah minority. Yeah, we felt it was important to show <laughs> these I'm sorry uh, for all statistics. those numbers, but no, 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 it's, no. Uh, it's, it's amazing. It's truly amazing. And, it, um, uh, uh, and I think one of the, imp uh, there are many uh, uh, conclusions to be drawn from what you uh, uh, so br briefly said, but one of them is indeed that uh, you are representing a large majority uh, uh, in Iran. And where he's uh, uh, from many parts, we've been, heard, we've been told that uh, you're just, you know, um, um, a, a meddling, uh, a peddling uh, misinformation or it's a small part of the society. Or the, and that's, that's very interesting, of course, very interesting. But another thing is that it's not polarized. It's not splintered, uh, as being portrayed very often, of course. Um, um, uh, and uh, uh, among the many different ethnicities, it's the same, so it doesn't make any, any difference. Because there's a lot of talk, of course, that there's uh, ethnic uh, division and strive and that sort of but, thing. But you know where, where that uh, comes from? Please tell me. It's the government's propaganda trying to divide the people. And sometimes it's successful. So please let this evening be a reminder that 
uh, there's space for everyone to t talk and let's keep that space open mm -hmm. and not fall for, for example, the girls you saw in my film also want a free Iran. It's not like anyone wants any, anything else. I know nothing about numbers, but what I know is just logic. How many women are here? I mean, how many of you would love to be forced, to be bitten, to be tortured, to be... <laughs> this is it. This is my logic, so... And um, clearly the Islamic Republic has no logic in trying to sell this narrative to the rest of the world. So we don't expect them to be mature and knows about number, which is not my expertise, but as I said, we don't expect the Islamic Republic to respect the logic and... Uh, but we expect the Western countries when it comes to forcing seven-year-old girl to cover herself, then don't say this is your culture, you know? Yeah, it's so simple. <laughs> Lady saw that. I no. keep getting back to this and I know you might get frustrated, but it's frustrating. Well, I think one thing that's uh, important to note that um, in conversations I've had so far with politicians, it's surprising that the polls that were backed by the Iranian regime actually influence also Western politicians. Yeah. So this is amazing. Like you saw these crazy things, like you know, Raisi is super popular, right? You you would think that some politicians know better, but unfortunately, that's not always the case. And I've heard colleagues see the Pew Research Center results with 83% support for Sharia in the Constitution saying, really? You think that's bad? I thought it was low. Yeah. Because they just, don't, they just don't know or they don't want to know. But so, yeah, unfortunately, that's uh, something we are up against. Now, um, uh, uh, the, the charter we've been talking about earlier says that there's a, a future for a secular uh, Iran. Um, uh, uh, that's the, the charter we've just been discussing uh, uh, earlier on of a, a whole range of uh, 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 exiled opposition. Looking at these numbers, would you say, what would you say about that? Is, that? is that totally unreasonable or is that...? No, I think, I think uh, uh, political secularism, as in the separation of organized religion from the state, um, is uh, something that the majority uh, demands. It shows from, from the numbers. Um, and uh, then, of course, in you know, uh, secularism studies, we have many debates ab about the exact form of secularism, which kind of secularism, French, American, Indian, they're not the same. But um, I think most people have a basic understanding that organized religion should not be established in the state. Right? And you hear also that Iranians use the word secular, the English word secular, or they use the French word laïcité. Laïcité, yeah. Laïc, right? They use these words. So um, do, do, does everybody have a perfect understanding of what secularism means? Of course not. But I do think that using the word secular, like you just you said secular democracy, is very important because we know that Yes, not all secular regimes are democratic. We also had the Soviet Union was also secular, but not democratic. So it, we know that secularism is not enough. But in the context of Iran, using that word is, I think, very important because it's a sort of stance towards religious domination, right? When you use the word secular and tie it to democracy, what you mean is that we oppose religious domination uh, and then, I think the charter shows that there is um, also a liberal element. It's not just secular, it's not just democratic in the sense of majority rule, but the charter also um, you know, uh, has elements that support minority rights uh, and that support not just you know, the group or the majority, but also individual rights. Um, so put together, that is, I think, uh, yeah, uh, of course, light years uh, ahead of what we have now. I want to actually add something, that the Friday prayer, Molavi Abdul Hamid from Zahedan, people were amazed that he was one of them actually, you know, not very popular before the revolution, I'm being very honest. But now, even he himself 
who has huge supporters uh, every Friday, they actually keep the flame of the revolution alive, came out recently and said that, used the word secular democracy, and he said that, you know, we want to have a separation from religion uh, and, and states. And this is now when you go actually ask to religious people, they want to do it because they know that even any, any Iran without religious dictatorship will benefit those who believe in religion and they want to practice their own religion. So what we want is clear, but w this time we see a lot of religious people joining this and calling for a secular democracy. <laughs> Can I add an image to that as a filmmaker here? Um, one of the most beautiful scenes in that timeline I have in my head is uh, in the Kurdish cities like Mahabad, where part of my family is from. They use the mosques, the minarets, to play revolutionary yeah. songs during the protests. Like, plant that in your head, and then you understand the switch that's been happening and how there's place for private religion um, and how uh, even the mullahs in certain regions are supportive of secularism. Yeah, because otherwise the music, would, music wouldn't have been played from the from the mosque. Well, well, we all know like, that's not what you use a mosque for <laughs> normally, yeah. but imagine hearing revolutionary songs through yeah. the minaret of your city. And that, and that could be only be done if the local clergy would agree. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm drawing, trying to draw too close, but um, if I look at that number, so we see about 15%, maybe one five uh, of the population being might be in, in favor of a, and the other part of the uh, of the population obviously isn't. So there's a tiny minority ruling, a big majority. So it's it's it is, um, is the main instrument for doing that, is that the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps? Yeah. 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 They have power, yeah. money. Yeah, because uh, ideologically it, it has crumbled. So what's left is brute force. Yeah. yeah. And that's why we ask the leaders of democratic country to recognize the Revolutionary Guards as a terrorist organization, because this is the only way that a, a tiny, tiny a uh, group with no legitimacy within the country can rule the majority who want to have dignity, who want to have a normal life. You know, that's how they create fear among the society. They have money. They have, for, I remember when Ghassem Soleimani got killed, clearly they shut down all the schools, university, shops. They forced all the, you know, those people, they, they, they were under the control of the states to have a funeral, but they were so biorze, they even killed their own <laughs> supporters. I cursed them. Right, that was very funny. Yeah, and I, I have to curse them sometimes. <laughs> so they actually couldn't actually manage that funeral. They uh, killed 70 people in, in his funeral. But what I was trying to say that Assem Soleimani, because of the money that they have, the propaganda tool that they have, the Islamic, TV, all the educational system, all the Friday prayers, they made him like a hero. And I kept hearing from uh, CNN, Channel 4, BBC, all the main news channel that the national hero of the Iranian people by, got killed by the US government. And I was like telling my husband, they're talking about our hero, but without asking our opinion. So this is how they can handle it. When they have money, when they have guns and bullets, when they have the power, they can even buy the media in the West as well, and misinformation, disinformation, everywhere. We knew that Qasem Soleimani is killers, but killer, but we didn't have the media, the mainstream media, to say that. Yeah. Now we have the power thanks to the Woman Life Freedom Revolution. And we saw the Wall Street Journal and Guardian articles you took out, so a, a, a fragment of uh, of those those mainstream media. Um, uh, let's. Um, so that's why it's probably so important that I saw you make our prime minister make a promise that he will insist in Brussels on putting the Revolutionary Guard as an organization on the international terrorist yeah. list. Yeah. I, and yeah. I insist yeah. Iranians don't go back home until the Revolutionary Guards is on the terrorist list. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, as is always the case, um, I'm looking into the audience if there's anybody who um, has a question. Uh, questions are sentences which go slightly up at the end and have a question mark. Um, <laughs> you can comment. And if there aren't, but there might be, don't be afraid. It's, you know, there's a woman over there um, raising her hand. Uh, hi, so I have a question actually from Mayor of Amsterdam. Uh, I just want to know, uh, yes, of course, now media are talking about us and they're like uh, saying woman life freedom and everything. And of course we have this uh, big, beautiful picture on the museum, but what else you can do also to empower us and to give the platform to us? Because what we heard right now is just like lobbies from Islamic Republic or media that they are like supporting Islamic Republic or even they are unaware of the situation of in Iran. They are just giving voice, like giving platform and they were talking all around like false information in the media, but not the people who actually are let's say, uh, that, yeah, they need to give the pl uh, have the platform. They uh, cannot speak. So mm -hmm. maybe it's good uh, for the whole Amsterdam, the whole Netherlands to have this more uh, platform to talk a little bit more because like what, like most of us living here and then what we heard mm -hmm. from our friends that they are not Iranian, they were like, Mm, yeah, but I think this is, uh, the situation is bad, but it's going to be like this. We are not hopeful. Yeah, blah, yeah, blah, blah. But, but um, personally, so, I'm... So, so the question is... Yeah, the, the question, question is, is what uh, <laughs> you can actually do for uh, yeah, rising this flame. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I'm not too sure whether we uh, will... Uh, have to, I can answer that because I... I um, and, if, and, if, and if there is... Uh, uh, the, of course, the mayor can answer. It's, a, it's her city. But... <laughs> that's 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 up. That's up to the woman, not to me, and not to you, and also not to you. Well, I'm not often silenced, so. Um, but uh, thank you for the question, and it's also a painful question because we're a local government, and it means that our actions are mostly symbolic because we do not have uh, relationships with Iran. There is no um, way for us to oppose the, uh, uh, directly the Iranian government, but we can talk to the national government. And um, I will um, uh, remind the prime minister of the talk he had with uh, Masi, uh, but it's, it's indirect, it's, it's just, um, well, reminding the people of Amsterdam and the people of the Netherlands that there is a revolution going on and that there are women fighting for their life, but it's only asking uh, attention. Hi, my name is Sepi de Powells. Dasmalchi, for lots of Iranian, um, they know the family name Dasmalchi because my uncle, uh, in Mekonas affair, he was a survivor and he opposed against the Islamic regime. Uh, we flew uh, to Netherlands in 91. I'm in the city council on behalf of Khrun Links right now. We have also, as a Dutch politician, I can say I'm Dutch, um, I should actually want to point the relevance of this um, revolution, of this movement, on the safety, on the issue of the woman violence, honor killing, which is very much um, these days in the Netherlands, big cities like Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Utrecht, and you know all. So what kind of signal, and I'm knowing, and I'm really happy that you are here tonight, um, but the thing is broader than that. We should not say what we can do for Iran, but the Iran can do for us. Because the symbolic thing of Iranian women would save the world economically, safely, and all kind of human rights that you can imagine. We are the mothers. I brought my daughter tonight. and. You know, at the schools, the violence, the pictures of Charlie Hebdo, we know the things and the treatments. 
of this radical Islamic thinking, and we need to take sight and be at the right side of the history. Thank you. We agree. That was my question. <laughs> <laughs> the mayor does agree. Um, yeah, there's a few questions left. There's, I think there's somebody over there, and there's a, uh, a lady over here. Yeah, there's a lady over here. By purpose, you're ignoring men. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Shirzad. I'm from Afghanistan. I just I wanted to personally also thank you for naming the Afghan women Woo! and the Taliban. <laughs> Um, I'm also a human rights activist and organized a lot together, united with my uh, Iranian sisters. And recently I organized a program about the future for Afghanistan. And what's difficult for me in that is that we often echo in rooms with diaspora. So what is our mandate here? And um, I heard Puyan say recently something about having um, political capital as activists outside. But what, what comes after the revolution? I want to learn from that because we actually are celebrating the women of Iran, and we should. But what comes after? Yeah. You asking me? Oh, fantastic. I want to actually. <laughs> because, you know, I feel guilty when I go somewhere, uh, talk about Iranian women, and not mentioning about the bravery of women of Afghanistan within the country, <laughs> challenging Taliban. Yes. And I always say that the women of Afghanistan must be, must be an example, like a true feminist and hero for the global feminist movement. And I believe in that because they are there facing Taliban, but they are not, they are wounded, but unbowed, unbreakable. And this should be recognized by Western feminist global movement. Look, this revolution, this revolution is a revolution which actually giving uh, hope to women of Afghanistan as well if we win this. And that is why I believe that we, the women of Iran and Afghanistan, we have to be loud to promote our campaign, to call the leaders of democratic countries, first to uh, expand the definition of apartheid, to gender in all international laws. Why I'm saying that? Because that actually gives you a path to the parliamentarians, to the leaders of democratic countries, to take a strong action the way that they did to the racial apartheid. For, for example, uh, many leaders, when it comes to racial apartheid, they take action. But when it comes to gender apartheid, they don't, because there is no definition about gender apartheid on international laws, and they put it in, a, this, in this way, which I always make, make it clear that they put it in this way, this is the culture of uh, women of Afghanistan. No, kicking out women of Afghanistan from schools is not cultural matter. It is called gender apartheid. Yeah. So we have to be united. We have to be united and push them to put this gender apartheid in all international laws and ask them to stop legitimizing Islamic Republic and Taliban. We have to always say that they are together and there is no difference between them. We have seen this movie before. The Islamic Republic, told they, many years, they brainwashed us and they were saying that they're gonna, be, they're gonna reform. So Taliban and Islamic Republic cannot be reformed together we have to actually bring them down. So this revolution is our revolution. It's about our dignity. We can win this battle together. Yeah. <laughs> and believe me, women of Afghanistan and Iran can run the countries better than these backward Akhund and Talib. Yeah. It's 10 o'clock. Um, uh, there are many more questions. I'm aware of that. Um, uh, um, I hope. Uh, we can uh, uh, have a drink together. Uh, before that, as a last thing, um, our good friend and artist in residence, Mohamed Ulslahi, who talked over the internet uh, uh, to you uh, one and a half year ago, is here now tonight and has brought a little present, which um, uh, I would like you to give to. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I really appreciate that. I don't know.
Oh, actually, that's perfect. Merci, Halina Jad. Thank you so much. <laughs> can I open it here, or is it very private? And I, have, I can open it. Oh, thank you so much. I told you I'm not used to it. I said that. Oh my God. It's beautiful. I can invite you all oh in free God. Iran very soon, and I, these Iranians are going to give you a gift. <laughs> no? Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you all three very much. Thank you, Mayor of Amsterdam, Femke Halsema. Uh, thank you for, uh, uh, for your art, for your statistics, and for your amazing activism. Uh, thank you for being here, all of you. Um, at the 1st of April, we have a whole day uh, uh, on uh, the Yazidi and Yazidi women. Um, um, several programs with uh, several women uh, coming uh, out of northern Iraq. Um, uh, together with Ray Badosky, who made an amazing film about them. We have uh, several programs. Uh, so uh, if you care about the women of Afghanistan, the women of uh, Iran, uh, uh, please uh, uh, take note of uh, the program on the 1st of April, because the women of the Yazidi community uh, deserve it. Um, we're going to listen for the last time, for the third time, to uh, the choir, and then we, uh, 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 we can leave. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Thank you. 